when we were setting this up, I, I think when we were discussing how, how to approach this, I, I know that you are not like in the ICUs, you're not in the COVID units or the emergency department, I guess, in general, when it comes right. uh, to your profession. But something I really wanted to talk to you about is, you know, you working in this other department, you know, how is COVID affecting just the whole medical establishment in general? Like, like in, for instance, in your profession, how is COVID, like the de- direct effects that COVID is having on how you do your job, basically? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so we've kind of had, you know, the two separate waves that the hospital's been directly, like, severely affected by. The first one was, of course, back in March, April, May. And um, because we didn't have the ability to test, just like everybody else in the country, um, you know, we were all short on testing for COVID. Mm-hmm. We uh, actually stopped doing surgery Um for several weeks other than doing uh, il- like uh, emergency cases, something like if you have a, an appendix that needs to come out or, you know, some sort of critical surgery that you would need. Um, and I can't remember how long we were, it was, I think it was somewhere between four or six weeks that we were really not seeing very many cases, like in the teens, probably per day when we would normally do 30 to 40. Mm-hmm. 25 to 40, somewhere in there. Um, And so once we were able to start testing people and the test kits became more widely available, we went ahead and everyone has to have a a COVID swab. I think it's within three days, 24 hours to 36 hours of their procedure so that they can, you know, of course they're positive and it's an elective case, they're going to, they're going to say, sorry, you have to wait till you're negative. Um, It's really interesting though. I mean, we have, we've had multiple people that have come in and have no idea that they have COVID, Mm. you know, if we have to do it that day week, so we can do either a very rapid one that takes a matter of an hour or so, or the one that's 36 to 48 hours, that one takes longer, of course, but it's a, I think it's a culture. So it's a little bit more, um, a little bit more accurate maybe. Okay. Um, So we, yeah, we just, once we were able to start testing people again, we went right kind of back to the way things had been. Of course, we at that point were all wearing masks and the hospital was not allowing any visitors in with family, you know, which is hard for everybody, right? Mm-hmm. Like who wants to go to the hospital by themselves? <laughs> yeah, right. It was, there was a lot of, um, I mean, I can only speak to our department. I, you know, like I remember talking to some, one of my friends who was pregnant and having her ultrasound to find out the gender of her baby and her husband couldn't be there. Mm. Um, So like, you know, it's different in every department. Um, And that, you know, they would make exceptions for people who like, if you had a disabled person who's who needed a caretaker or a child would of course be able to have a parent with them. But for the most part, most people were just there by themselves. Um, So it was, it was kind of back to normal. And then when this whole second wave started coming, um, our, I feel like our our healthcare system was really kind of trying to anticipate and get ahead of it, which I really appreciate. I I think all the healthcare systems are because this has been a make or break thing for healthcare. Yeah. Um, and so we, a couple weeks ago, probably two or three weeks ago, the, they announced that here in Magic Valley, they would not be admitting any pediatric patients. They have to sh- to send them um, to Boise. And then we, not too long after that, stopped doing elective surgeries that would require admission. So things like total joints or knee- knees or hips or backs or major abdominal surgeries that would require someone to stay overnight. So um, that's a big, that's a fairly big chunk of what we do. We're still able to do a lot of cases. We we're back to about, I'd say probably 20 to 30 cases a day. Mm. So that's been great as far as being able to stay, you know, stay at work and have a job. And um, I think we were lucky enough the first go around that there was a lot of federal um, funding through the relief efforts that, they were able to help pay people who weren't in surgery um, or who they would just 
if people were um, fairly recently had come from the floor mm -hmm. from the ICU or from the surgical or medical floor, they would pull them back if they needed them. So they were just kind of doing some rearranging. Um, we haven't had to do a whole lot of that this time around, but um, there's definitely some of my cohorts that are working back on in IC or on the surgical floor that um, because they've been really busy. Yeah. And this go around, we have um, we've had the added problem of having the nursing staff and the doctors and the respiratory therapists and the CNAs and everyone who works at the hospital actually also having COVID. So the first go around, you know, it was like we were mostly getting patients from Wood River area because they had a real hot spot with that first wave. Um, and so the vast majority of the people here had not had to deal with it. And we didn't have a whole lot of nursing staff and hospital staff that had COVID at the same time while they're trying to take care of patients. Right. So this, do you think that the second wave that we're now going through do you feel that the hospital is more prepared in general, or at least in your department? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I they've done they've done a really good job. Um, you know, it's hard because everybody needs the same thing. We, you know, all the hospitals across the United States need the same thing. I'm I'm not absolutely certain, but it seems to me that the recommendations that are coming from the people that are the physicians that are frontline for this particular disease process have really tried to move away from using ventilators unless they absolutely have to. Um, and at first that, you know, you heard that all the time, ventilator shortage. Um, but I think they're trying to manage patients that before we would have put on a ventilator in different ways with a high flow, mm. you know, high flow oxygen and what we call BiPAP and CPAP, which are kind of a step down from that. Um, and then they figured out some medications that are helping. So, you know, it's like we at least kind of know what we're dealing with now. It's this virus is really weird. Um, what's, it's really weird. Like it's one of the weirdest things I've ever encountered in medicine. <laughs> what's, what's weird about it exactly? So it's just very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. It has this really weird um, incubation period. So most most viruses, you know, it's like within a week of exposure, you're probably going to have symptoms, probably even closer to five days, five to, you know, five to seven. But this one, they've said that it has anywhere from two to 14 days as the incubation period. And so, you know, you heard about it the first go around. If you have a 14 day window when you could potentially be incubating a virus and in that case, shedding it you're going to come in with contact and expose exponentially more people than you would if you had a two or three day, right. you know, exposure time and incubation time. So in that way, it spreads much more, much better really mm -hmm. than the flu does or than most viruses that we have. And it also affects people so differently. Like you, you hear this, you know, you've got the classic shortness of breath and um, cough but then, you know, some people get this weird rash and then other people get it, you know, stomach symptoms and then other people are completely asymptomatic, um, yeah. but are positive. So it's just like a really weird virus. And they're finding that it actually is having um, some pretty serious long term sequelae. Um, it, it seems like it causes some inflammatory problems in the body. It can cause problems with like blood clots um mm. they're having people that are having it's almost like mono where you have this really um really fatigued you, you just don't have any energy you can't go up the stairs like you used to some people are having cardiovascular problems afterwards i mean it's a it's a nasty virus yeah it's it's very and it's very unpredictable and truthfully i mean how do you track and you know, manage a virus that is so undetectable in so many cases. It's just, it's kind of a mind boggler. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing with the, the long-term issues I've definitely met, I know people that, I mean, they had it like six months ago and they're still struggling mm -hmm. with fatigue or mental fog. There's a lot of stuff dealing with that. People just, they're like, I can't remember things as well as I used to, or I can't think as clearly. It's just this fog that I'm in all the time. 
Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very strange virus. It's very, very weird. And then the the thing about the was it, the incubation or am I saying that correctly? Incubation period. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's that's the thing that actually scares me the most about it is like you could be spreading it and have no physical symptoms. You would you feel completely healthy and fine. And I right. actually, and I wanted to ask this about the testing, and I don't know how much you can talk about the testing because one of the issues they have with testing is people will they'll be like, all right, I'm going to go travel, and so I'm going to go get tested, and they go to one of these places that's providing, you know, whether you pay or it's free or whatever it is, you get a test. And they say you tested negative and then, you know, they start coming down with symptoms. So that means they had it while they were getting tested and they still tested negative. So do you have any idea why those tests are not reading positives when they are positive, in fact? Yeah. So there's a couple different factors that might be going into that. Of course, each, um, you know, each testing kit or, you know, that comes from a different company will have, they sh- they have data that they'll give you. You know, there's a sheet that comes right with it that says, this is our false positivity rate. This is our false negativity rate. And so um, it varies by the test and the company that makes it. But from what I understand, the rapid test is the one that people are generally, I think, getting in the event, what you're talking about, where you need a, you need a, a result like now within right. the next day or two. So that test, um, if done correctly, which is also another, (laughs) that's another thing you have to know, you know, like in order to get that test done correctly, I have to put like a giant long Q-tip that's on a kind of a a wire almost Mm -hmm. into someone's nose and then back into the back of their throat, which is incredibly uncomfortable. Like even if people know it's coming, they almost instinctively try to grab your hand away because it's very uncomfortable and you have to leave it in there for five seconds, at least, you know, swirling it back and forth and making their eyes water. So one of the problems is maybe people aren't doing that correctly. Right. Cause that's incredibly uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, that test from what I understand um, looks for the antigen. So it looks for actual part of the virus Um and it, different people have different amounts of the virus that they carry in their in their nasopharyngeal area. So that's also another factor. So some people might, like I had a patient the other day who had tested positive a month ago and is still testing positive with mm-hmm. no symptoms. So she probably has like a really high viral load in the back right. of her throat. She's carrying this bug around and it really likes her for some reason. Hmm. So that test is has a little bit higher false negative rate because um, the other test is actually cultured from what I understand. So it's actually done. It's called a PCR test. So it's a polymerase chain reaction test. It's the same way they would do like if in a, in a crime scene, they would replicate DNA that they found. Right. So, you know, they find a blood drop, they put it in this solution and it replicates the DNA. And so then they have a really big sample that they can use in order to try to figure out whose DNA it is. Same, same idea with the virus. So it's got this little bit of viral RNA um, and then it just replicates it. So it's almost like a culture would be. Um, And then another good example that I can think of is like when you get strep throat, they'll do a quick strep, right? And that's not super, um, like super accurate all the time gives us a good idea like if it's positive it's almost always right but if it's negative we usually send it away for culture and two days later we get back a report from the lab that says oh yeah she actually has strep we didn't you know we didn't think she had enough um, on that first sample um, but it cultured out in you know like a petri dish that it's actually yes she does have strep so does that make sense yeah i think so yeah yeah it does i guess it's just how it's done, how effective it is as far as how the test itself works. Right. Yeah. And I think this also, I think what is this sort of this weird thing where it's like people completely distrust modern Western medicine, like just, just how all of this works. Some people don't even believe viruses exist, you know? And then there's the other side of it where people trust it so much that like there's no room for error or infallibility or just like the reality that, 
viruses like this novel coronavirus is we've only known about it for maybe a year when it was first yeah. detected in in Wuhan China you know so there's a lot of things like you just mentioned all the crazy you know varied symptoms that people have it's like we're right. still trying to get our head around what this thing actually is and what the best even what the best course of action is as far as dealing with it and trying to limit yeah. its spread yeah to some degree at least there's some things that we know yeah. that actually work but yeah so the majority of like common cold viruses that, that you get are actually coronaviruses it's just the type of virus right. right yeah and generally they kind of follow the same you know you, you like you know when you're getting a cold because they're almost always the same it's not like you have all these weird symptoms like that yeah so it's been a real it's been a real mind twister for us, I think, trying to deal with it as a medical community. And something that I think it is really hard for people to understand, too, is that they they keep saying things like, well, they keep changing their minds about things. You know, they're saying this works and they say, oh, never mind, it doesn't. Or, you know, at yeah. first, I, I guess there was some some noise that they shouldn't wear and people shouldn't wear masks. I was like, we need masks right away. Like, right, I right. lived in a little while and like during the cold season, everybody wears a mask. Like this was 20 years ago. That's just what you do. Like when there's 2 billion people in your country and it's cold season, you wear a mask. <laughs> you were in, you said you were in Asia. Uh, Is that what you said? Yeah. Yeah. I lived in China for uh, nine months. Oh, okay. Uh, back yeah. in 2000. So it wasn't like a weird concept for me. Um, but, you know, it's like, I feel like people may not understand the concept sometimes of, evidence-based practice, which just means our practice changes as the evidence directs it. Right. So, you know, like I'm doing this thing and then I find a research study, which takes time, right? You can't just pop up with evidence and research without having time a lot. Um, and then I readjust the way I'm doing something based on what that evidence tells me. And so I hear a lot of people say that, like, you know, because something has changed, it must be that they don't know what they're talking about. And really it's exactly the opposite. You know, it's like, this is actually solid, a solid reason to change the way we're doing something. And you should be encouraged by that because that means that we're not afraid to say, Oh, Hey, we were wrong. We thought this, and now we're moving ahead with this because this is the best information that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just how science works. Or at least that's how it should work, yeah. you know. And I, you know, I sometimes I don't know if people, <laughs> I, I don't know, was science like a really long time ago or is that not <laughs> taught? Like I really run well, into that a lot. I'm like, this is how science works, guys. It's like the scientific process. Yeah. But then I don't want to come off as being like a snob either. Like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I but mean, I, I, yeah, sorry. I tend to be more on the side what you were saying, where it's like I I kind of will agree with science to a fault. So I have to be really careful with that too. You know, it's like we are certainly fallible as as humans. Um, healthcare is always evolving, and it's really imp important to listen to you know patients and you know get the best data that we can and change as we need to.